Ladies and uh, gentlemen, a very, very warm welcome to St. Helier uh, Methodist Centre. My name is Tony Morling. I'm the minister in this church, which I'm glad to say is open seven days a week and is committed to serve this local community with many other agencies as well. It's been here since 1847. And just look up at that remarkable flat, unsupported uh, ceiling, a real piece of uh, Victorian engineering, hosted many activities during the course of its life, and we're delighted tonight to welcome this important uh, husting. Can I just ask you to locate uh, the closest emergency exit in case in the unlikely circumstance we would need to do so, and either journey through this way to Hulkett Place or through these doors uh, to uh, Vauxhall Street. If you need assistance, uh, to leave the building, please indicate, and we will have stewards uh, to be with you. But it's great to be here. I did hear of a Methodist minister who was speaking and asked, can you hear? And somebody put their hand up and said, uh, yes, I can, but I'm very willing to exchange for somebody who can't. I think we know what they meant. Uh, what we're saying tonight is uh, we're here to listen and to uh, discern a way forward for the benefits of all uh, the island community. So thank you for coming. You're most, most welcome. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Reverend Tony Morley, and for letting us have the use of the Methodist Centre at such a, a reasonable rent. Um, we were concerned that the town hall might prove a little crowded. It has done in the past. Um, certainly for the candidates, if not for those who've come to hear them speak and ask questions. Uh, if you've been to a senatorial hustings before, you'll know the format. It's been agreed by the candidates. Uh, they will each make a speech for a maximum of three minutes. Uh, and then there'll be two rounds of public questions. And we'll take three questions, which will be answered. Uh, one or more of them will be answered by the candidates. And then we'll take three more questions. And that's all there'll be time for. And I will be hoping that St. Helier parishioners... Uh, will be the first to ask questions, and I haven't forgotten that there are some people upstairs uh, and there are people of all ages and genders who have a right to ask questions. So I will be doing my best as chairman to uh, spread the questions around. Uh, so thank you for coming, and without more ado, uh, I'm going to ask the candidates to uh, begin their three-minute speeches, starting with Chris McGee. Good evening ladies and gentlemen, my name is Chris McGee, I'm 25 years old and I have a law degree from the University of Edinburgh. Prior to moving to the island 12 years ago with my family, the picture I was painted of Jersey was one of promise and prosperity. Beautiful beaches, higher wages, lower levels of taxation and unemployment. Today however that has changed. Even the beaches were a half expected Godzilla to rise out of the green slime at St Aubin. Wages are 4% higher than in the UK but it costs 20% more to live here. Over 40% of islanders are living paycheck to paycheck. We've seen the creation and increase of GST against public outcry. The one-two combination of GST and stealth taxes hits those who can afford at least the hardest, whilst inflation erodes what little is left in their wallets. Those, for, those working 40 hours a week on minimum wage have to claim up to nine grand a year from income support just to survive. It's only the common man that has to pay for this, which is the Jersey way after all. Corporate subsidy has been branded as a solution to unemployment through government make-work programmes, such as the Advance to Work scam, I mean scheme. The jobs which are being created by this programme are often low-skill, low-paying jobs, which some might say is just as well, as it's yours and not the employer's money which is being paid as wages. Wages are the state's biggest expenditure. This is why the government has recently expanded itself by 200 employees to almost 8,000. 14% of the island's workforce are now government employees. Because anyone who would dare to question whether there was a way in which the free market could provide the same level of service with greater accountability and lower level of costs must be admitted to St Saviour's immediately, where, as I have been told, they will receive unparalleled levels of treatment. This is why, despite all the lip service of government reform, the current State's Assembly ignored the results of the last referendum. I think the state should be congratulated, as it only took them decade after decade to admit that the electoral system is deeply unfair and unrepresentative. Why bother voting when, after all, if you don't like it, there's a vote in the morning? Unrepresentative accurately describes many of those in the state's chamber. There are those who will talk a lot while saying nothing. Those whose primary interest is their self. 
There are even those sitting here now who have campaigned to get rid of the role of senator, yet here they are asking for your votes to be a senator. The states are quick to point to a death resulting from the use of legal highs as a tragedy, whereas alcohol being the direct cause of death for one in 50 is just the cost of doing business. Heroin problem? What heroin problem? Tramadol epidemic? Homelessness? Child abuse? Never heard of it. These are the issues which so often are swept under the rug in order to publicly promote an image of Jersey as a pristine paradise, PS, not a tax haven. My generation grew up with the internet. We know how to use a search engine. We know how to think for, himself, for ourselves. We're old enough and clever enough to see through the facades and the divergence. No longer can the truth be hidden from us. The era of governmental deception, corruption and cover-ups will be brought to an end. We know that if we close our eyes, cross our fingers and hope it goes away, that will never happen. We must make it so, and we will. An idea whose time has come cannot be stopped by any army or any government. If you agree, vote Chris McGee. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, perfectly to time, Eric's hand was just on the bell, and I'm sure the other candidates are equally practiced in delivering their speeches in three minutes. And now Ian Gorst. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Ian Gorson. It's been an honour for me to serve as Chief Minister for the last three years. Of course, there's no question that over those three years, the island has faced challenges and we've not been immune from the effects of the worldwide economic downturn. But as Head of Government, I have sought always to build consensus to deliver for islanders, facing up to our problems and making difficult decisions. Of course, we all equally know in this room that challenges remain. But I believe that if we unite as one community, we can deliver a strong future. Because I want to see a Jersey where my daughters grow up, which is inclusive, where there is support for those who are less well off, for those who are old, for those who are vulnerable, but also importantly support for those who have initiative uh, and want to better themselves. A Jersey where we do embrace diversity and we, where we all feel that we have a future. Over the last three years, we have made good progress. We've enabled 50 families to buy new homes. We've introduced discrimination legislation and family-friendly legislation. We have started to reform the public sector and we're starting to deliver e-government. We started to redesign the health service. We've invested in social housing. We've helped thousands of islanders into paid work. That's businesses working in partnership with government. And I believe that we can be proud of that progress and that, that those programmes are working. But more than ever, over the next three years, we need to foster an environment that encourages economic growth and diversification that supports businesses, that supports innovation, and that supports enterprise. Of course, we've already set up a new tourism shadow board. We've supported agriculture. We've created Digital Jersey and the Innovation Fund. We must support the promotion of new technologies and niche areas such as fintech and Bitcoin. We've also started to prepare for our future, because uh, we know that if we don't invest, it will cost more in the long term. We've got a new liquid waste strategy. We started to deliver a new hospital. We started to prepare for the long term. We started to make savings across the states, but more must be done and states departments must deliver more efficiencies and they must live within their current budgets. So much has been achieved over the last three years, but no doubt you're going to question us this evening about the tasks that remain. It would, ladies and gentlemen, be an honour for me to be given the opportunity to utilise my experience, my motivation and my energy to continue to serve you to build a healthy and secure future for us all. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Jeff uh, Habin. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen of St. Helia. My name is Jeff Haben. I'm a businessman. I'm a management accountant, current chairman of Jersey Friends of Air Search. I have a proven track record in business, encompassing the motor industry, the airline industry, retail, building, and consulting in varying parts of the world. In the last few years, I think in common with many, I've been somewhat disappointed in what I've observed in the States. I've seen not enough of putting the community first as a whole and Jersey first. 
and certainly the referendum, which has caused such a lack of faith and distrust in the Assembly, was not a thing that should ever be repeated. Our economy, we now know, seems to have hit bottom. Now, everything we would like to do now or in the future is tied to economic growth. And this we must get on to. If we can increase our economic growth, then we have more revenues, we have more money to spend, and certainly there are less pressures on tax, rate, uh, tax rises or GST. In the long term, we know there are fundamental changes to be done to the health service, the education system, social security. But in the short term, we must find those small little changes that can have a very big impact at the front line of services for all the community. But coupled to this also is the responsibility of the states to save money, to make itself more efficient on behalf of us all. We are supporting finance, tourism, digital initiatives, well and good, but small and, business, uh, small and medium businesses are not being supported well enough. We need to revisit licensing, the employment law, and the social contributions that self-employed make. If we can give them an easier time, it is the quickest way we will reduce unemployment and the social cost that goes with that. But with this, also we must support Highlands as much as we can. We are missing skill sets in the island, they've gone, we need to train locals. <coughs> this is the only way, both vocationally and higher education, that we will reduce immigration pressure in the future. My business background is in business. It means I have to be proactive and quick to react in changes in my environment. And the states must be quicker. We do need more action and less debate. I am a new face for you. I would very much like to represent you. I'm a common sense man. I'm very pragmatic and I like to get on with it. I would like to get on with it for you and I would like one of your votes. Thank you very much indeed. David Richardson. Good evening. My name is David Richardson. In the last two weeks, we've talked about many things. Slack immigration control to our expensive, all-singing, all-dancing new hospital. But nothing has prepared me for the news that we currently have a £100 million deficit in the budget, with 50, of which 50% is structural. The facts are stark. To quote SIFTA, the professional accounting body reporting to the states, prudence has been lost. It is difficult not to conclude the state's expenditure is out of control and suggest a lack of clear direction in setting of financial strategy. The following question begs an answer. In the 2004 uh, budget, did the Treasurer provide advice to the Treasury Minister which was based on more optimistic scenarios rather than those which were prudent, and if so, why? This may explain the hole in the budget. The, um, the Treasurer has now disappeared and resigned. Perhaps our current Treasury Minister can explain, give us an explanation. I'm an accountant, ladies and gentlemen, and I work in compliance in the finance industry. I get alarmed when I hear about expensive capital projects. According to the Financial Policy Panel, which is one of the highest, highly accoladed finance teams in the UK, we are currently going to, if we are currently going to invest in expensive capital projects, this may have two effects. Increase inflation, and worst of all, increase immigration. The panel's advice is that it is evidently too late to invest in rather grandiose, green, uh, grandiose projects. Furthermore, the middle-income people are making more, up to 10% more of the income tax burden <coughs> than six years ago, whilst those paying 20% has half from 12,000 to 6,000. I do not believe in raising taxes, although it appears absolutely apparent we must rebroaden our tax base. This could have an immediate saving of 12 million pounds. Jersey has been living beyond its means, and therefore we need competent people in the states who are able to carry out reforms. Efficiency savings need to be made, and this will hurt. Finally, one effect of the boom years of the 1890s is that we have neglected the island's natural beauties. Visitor numbers to Jersey have decreased in recent years. I was originally trained as a research scientist, and I am now an accountant that I see solutions where others don't. If elected, I would make it my priority to help in the budget. If you believe in a protection of local heritage, in a population balance, financially balanced books, vibrant, educated and forward-thinking Jersey, I humbly invite you to vote for David Richardson. Thank you.
Zoe Cameron. Considering what the future might hold to me, for me, took me back to thinking about the happiest time in my career, which was when I set up St. Warren's Village Surgery. What made this time so special? Being on call 24-7 may sound exhausting, but it meant that I witnessed and understood every medical emergency, birth and death that my patients went through. It was a privilege to come back to families that I'd grown up with, with the training and education to diagnose your problems, be able to ease pain and bring comfort. Truly a gift. During that time, I had instant feedback from, my, from Sylvia, my receptionist, who would inform me of any grumbles or comments that were less than complimentary as the day went on. And being prepared to acknowledge and learn from those meant that they became less frequent. In those days, being a professional was equated with values of integrity, altruism and expertise. But Harold Shipman changed all that. Doctors, like teachers, now have to prove they're doing the right thing. Medical textbooks have been replaced with shelves of policies and procedures. We are watched and have entered a world of accountability performance management, clinical guidelines, words of compliance, conformity, surveillance and suspicion. Errors are no longer tolerated. Doctors are no longer trusted. The art of care has transformed into the machinery of care. The system now gives us feedback as well as the patient and the pressure is intense. Healthcare professionals are demoralized, <coughs> frightened, and are losing the qualities of integrity and altruism as we concentrate on surviving the day. Yet if governance is done in a safe environment, it can be very different. In German and Swiss hospitals, staff still sit down to discuss what could have gone better and debrief brief at the end of the day in the same way as I used to in my, in my, with my receptionist. I know from listening to you that many of you are under the same pressure Bernie Madoff, MPs expense scandalous, scandals and benefits cheats have done for the finance industry, politicians and disabled what Harold Shipman have done for doctors. No one trusts each other anymore. Jersey is no longer trusted. By stepping out of my surgery and into politics, I hope to give you the chance to help create a culture of kindness and learning on Jersey instead of blame and mistrust an open, honest, dependable government that works for everyone and where ideas and creativity can flourish. Thank you. Andrew Green. Mr. Conitab, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. My name's Andrew Green. All you have to remember on Wednesday is the colour, OK? Um, I'm proud to have been one of your St. Helier deputies for six years now. And when I look back, it is evident to me that I have achieved a great deal, both as a minister and as a deputy. I have been active in the parish. I have attended virtually every parish assembly since my elections. I have worked actively with associations in the parish, but in particular with the residents of First Tower. Sorry. Somehow my sheets have got muddled up. It's like... Just bear with me. Right, I'll carry on as I was. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, right. I gained the greatest satisfaction in assisting individual constituents, but of course I can't talk about any of these cases. One particular case I can talk about, however, is Pondor Farm. I took that proposition to the States and I achieved the funding to enable full refurbishment. It turned out that other contacts came from uh, from other uh, estates and people came back to me saying, what are you going to do about my estate? You sorted out Pomdor, what are you going to do about the rest? I then had the opportunity to stand for housing minister. I stood for housing minister and I brought forward the housing transformation plan. The housing transformation plan, transforming homes, transforming lives. Most important, that plan was described by other people as most honest and creative and inventive. But I don't just want to talk about what I've done in housing. I want to talk to you about what the role I'd like to see myself in in the future. I'd like to see myself as your next health minister. I'd like to see myself uh, bringing forward the changes that need to come forward in association, in association with mental health 
and in respite care. Care in the community is failing. I want to see great improvements in the community service. I want to see, time doesn't allow me to explain fully because I've got my sheets in the wrong order, but I want to see a community health service that's fit for purpose. I want to see a community health service that's proactive, not reactive. I want to see a community health service that we can all be proud of. Ladies and gentlemen, I want this for you, I want this for our families, and I want it for our island. Now, if you want a new face, a senator who is, uh, has courage, has vision, and can take <coughs> forward things to be done and get things done for you, please choose me for one of your senators. Thank you. <laughs> Guy Defay. Well, most of the state's members lined up before you have been in government for the last six years. And they'll tell you what they've done. They've done this, they've done that. And they've ended up with a current account that is minus £50 million. Pounds. They'll also tell you what they want to do. We'd like to do this, we'd like to do that. Why well, haven't you already got on with it? And what will they do? They'll be spending yet more of your money. <coughs> When I started on these hustings, I said I was shocked to see how the public service has expanded. When I was first in the States, there were around 6,300 public servants. The latest figure I had was 7,200 or so until today. When to my utter amazement, I discovered that the latest total is over 7,800 public <coughs> servants. Well, they all kept jolly quiet about it on the hustings. No one said, oh, Mr. Defoe, you got the figure wrong. Actually, it's 500 more than you thought. No, it's worse than that. Apparently, according to the media, when you add states members, jurats, commissions, quangos, the entire total is now 8,300 public servants, all being paid for out of taxpayers' money. So I say, if you're going to start to do something, let's get a grip on the expanding government, which is costing us a fortune. Years ago, we were promised a Rolls-Royce civil service. Well, now, like any Rolls-Royce, it's become too expensive to run. But what have they done about it? Nothing. They've let it get bigger and bigger and bigger. And here in St. Helier, you're all familiar with the major mistakes. Town park. <coughs> you, wanted a, you wanted a town park with an underground car park. I wrote two letters to the JP, actually directed at states members, saying, please, have you seen the enormous hole? Please put in an underground car park. It's what the people want. There's problems with parking in town. Did they? No, they didn't. Police station, I barely want to get started on that. Yet another car park being filled in for no good reason. If you want someone who's going to tell it straight, be honest with you, and by the way, stir it up in the States Assembly, please consider me for one of your votes. Sarah Ferguson. Thank you. This is an important election. State spending keeps rising and our income is falling. At the moment we have assets to cover this, but we have fewer people paying tax and no new source of income for the states to balance this. Last year we reduced the marginal rate by 1%. This has reduced state's income by £8 million. Removal of the deemed distribution has lost us at least another £6 million. Not a lot in the scheme of things, but £8 million here, £6 million there, soon adds up. The number of people paying tax at 20% has halved from around 12,200 to 6,800. Those paying at marginal rates pay 52% of the total personal income tax take. Six years ago, they paid 41% of the total. The tax burden is growing on Middle Jersey. When the financial services industry originally arose in Jersey, care was taken by Cyril Lamarcon to ensure that Jersey did not adopt policies to which critics would point and say, you're a tax haven. We have been under pressure from outside agencies regarding our tax system. We need to re-examine it to put the island back on the principled path charted by Cyril Lamarcond. 
As chairman of the Corporate Services Scrutiny Panel, we examined the budget. One conclusion is that we have a deficit, which has already been mentioned, in total over about 100 million, and around about 50 million of that on current account. Some of this is structural, and the only way to deal with structural deficits is to increase income, which could mean taxes, or to reduce spending, which could mean services, but in my experience, efficiencies can cut costs, not services. <coughs> but all that's been left until after the election. We are told that there will be a tax on gross rental income for private landlords. This will apparently be charged before expenses like repairs and renewals. What's the betting that this will lead to increased rents? And if social housing rents are to be 90% of the market, will this mean they go up as well? Not if I can help it. This is the most important election for 60 years. Your vote is your voice. It matters. Please use it. And please remember Sarah Ferguson on Wednesday. Lyndon Farnham. <clears throat> good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Guy's on good form tonight. I hate having to follow him and uh, Sarah Ferguson, but I've got one word to say to you, Guy. Incinerator. Let's move on. <laughs> two, two words. Good evening. I was first elected to the States as a deputy in 1999. I stepped down in 2005 to focus on my business and uh, family commitments, returning in 2011 when I was elected senator. I am the serving assistant minister at Home Affairs, where I hold special responsibility for the Jersey Fire and Rescue Service and the prison service. And I know how, how proud we all are of our excellent emergency uh, services, but I am especially proud to have served at a time when we have seen improvements in many areas and positive improvements to the police force leading to greater public confidence. And I'm pleased to say that our crime levels in Jersey continue to fall. I have successfully brought a number of propositions to the state since being re-elected, re including a move to introduce political accountability for our justice system. And I now sit on the Justice Advisory Panel and the Bayless Consultative Panel. I am the, the immediate past president of the Jersey Hospitality Association and continue to champion tourism as an important pillar of our economy. I fully support the long overdue rejuvenation of Fort Regent. And I am leading the campaign for a new 50 metre pool and associated facilities. And my appeal is, if we are going to have a new pool, please, let's do it properly. I also led the campaign to keep the island-wide mandate in the office of Senator, which I'm pleased to say is alive and well, and long may it continue, and I'm going to vote yes to keeping the constables. If you elect me, I shall be seeking the position of Economic Development Minister, not least because I believe that we must now put economic prosperity firmly back at the top of the agenda, not least because our economy, notwithstanding the good news that it's levelled off this year, is still at its lowest level since 1998. From agriculture and the rural economy, to sports and event-led tourism, to fintech and the digital economy, to small business development and the town economy, it's time to act, it's time to introduce the policies that will return strength, drive energy and some purpose to the economy. There's still a widespread belief in the island that the states are not performing effectively. The main concerns are that some politicians are motivated more by self-interest than the interest of the island, and that some simply do not have the knowledge, skills, or experience to be able to do the job. My politics are not about left or right or senseless bickering or time wasting. My politics are about getting things done, and that is why I don't support party politics, but I do support team politics, and I support working together for Jersey. Thank you. John Young. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Deputy of uh, St. Bernard's, and I chair the Environment Scrutiny Panel, and have completed many public hearings and reviews, including things like the Energy Policy and the Green Street Police Headquarters. And as a backbencher, I've gained state's agreement to many private members' propositions, things like changes to the island plan and amendments to planning law, and many others. Now, under current policies, St Helier is expected to absorb our future population growth. And to accommodate this growth, we must improve the town environment to make it an attractive place where people want to live. And this means 
not creating dense urban ghettos which will lead to future social problems. So we need to ensure that the public spaces are enhanced and that new town developments provide more open space. And we need to manage the impact of traffic on residential areas and provide parking for residents and visitors. And also recognise this town centre has to work for shoppers and workers. Now the regeneration steering group of ministers was set up three years ago but hasn't yet produced the required long-term urban regeneration plan to do this. And of course, we've read and we may hear of one minister's own 150-day plan for St Helier. However laudable this is, to succeed in planning for the long-term vision of our town and for Jersey requires long-term vision with a commitment to working with the community, you and others. And unfortunately, in recent years, our government's record has been one of piecemeal planning decisions. The town park's been mentioned, it was completed without the parking, disregarding a Norfolk Town master plan, foregoing the economic benefit of the, uh, on the area and losing opportunities. We need land in town for vital public uses, such as police headquarters, housing and a new hospital. But our government is, has become a developer of public land for offices when there is limited demand. I want the Esplanade site re-evaluated for the hospital. Then there is in the police headquarters. I'm not going to dwell on that. And then after 14 years, we've got major developments uh, on the girls' college and, and the gas works site. We need a big change to our government. I want all our ministers to become more open to listening to the views of the public and states members who represent them and rebuild lost tr trust in government. In this election, you have a choice. Voting for change or more of the same for the existing ministers. I have the capability and experience to deliver these changes. Ladies and gentlemen, I humbly ask you for your vote as Senator. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you. Malcolm Ferry. Mr Constable, ladies and gentlemen, I'm standing as a candidate in these elections because I believe the skills and abilities that I've gathered throughout my career will stand me in good stead to make a difference. In my role as Chief Executive of the Jersey Citizens Advice Bureau, I have campaigned successfully on many social issues and regularly make contact to various media outlets and put pressure on policymakers to help bring about real change that affects the lives of ordinary islanders. This work has taught me so much about the problems that exist and the problems that people in this island face on a daily basis. I believe that in the past, our government has focused on personalities and personal views rather than what is in the interests of the island as a whole. My politics are therefore centred on keeping in touch with the issues that affect the ordinary islander and professionalism in delivering the appropriate solutions. When you get a chance, I would ask that you visit my website, malcolmferry.com, and you can start my campaign video and see and hear all of the issues that I believe that are important. But in the meantime, I ask two questions. What sort of Jersey do you want to live in? And what kind of future do you want for our island? I see that too many families and individuals who can least afford it are struggling as a result of GST being levied on life's basic and essential items. Whilst I appreciate this loss would need to be drawn from elsewhere, we need to find a more equitable way of raising revenue. When it comes to planning, I would like to see more sympathetic development and redevelopment in line with the existing surroundings. Building out of a recession is a proven method of growing the economy. And of course, many people will quite rightly aspire to home ownership but it should no longer be to the detriment of the natural beauty of our island. So this Wednesday, you have a choice to make a difference and to vote for someone who understands the problems from the coalface. I'll leave you with this simple quote that somebody gave me on social media. Malcolm, it's people like you who give us all hope for the future. I hope that you realise that view and consider me for one of your votes on polling day. Thank you very much.
Philip Ozef. Uh, Mr. Constable, uh, ladies and gentlemen, well, I commenced uh, my political career here in St. Helier, and so it's appropriate that this uh, final hustings in the place uh, where my political journey started um, is ending this uh, hustings campaign. It is the place that I have never uh, forgotten that I have a special responsibility for. Uh, during my time in politics, I've served in some of the most challenging uh, states' departments. On my first day, I was elected the president of the Smaller States Committee. Uh, in 2002, I became vice president of finance and economics, arguing for the introduction of a competition law. In 2003, uh, after a series of political disasters, I was asked to take over planning and environment, dealing with issues such as the Trinity infill. Um, after uh, my period of time at planning and, envi in, and environment uh, ended, uh, I actually left a department that was in much better state, uh, a work motivated workforce that had delivered hundreds of new homes, secured sea walls uh, and properly maintained infrastructure. Also, that delivered um, urban renewal projects, such as at the time uh, the controversial Broad Street project. Then after successfully uh, being at economic development uh, for three years where we saw tourism numbers grow uh, and reserves put aside uh, for the difficult times, um, I was then asked to be the um, uh, Treasury Minister. During that time, uh, that has been entirely dominated by the uh, world's worst financial crisis. It has been difficult for many, especially islanders who have lost their jobs and pensioners who have suffered the effects of low interest rates. Ladies and gentlemen, the easy thing to do in politics is to put decisions off. I don't. On your behalf, I've had to make some very difficult decisions, some of the most controversial decisions in modern day politics, underfunding of health uh, and infrastructure. A number of candidates uh, say that our public finances are poor, that we have deficits. Uh, we have been investing, and we've been investing in order to get the economy going, getting unemployment uh, down. I have delivered, uh, ladies and gentlemen, through hard work, I have a hard work ethic. I'm the first in and the last to leave. I have lots of ideas for Jersey's future, which are positive. On your seats, you will find a plan for St. Helier. I believe that all senators have a special responsibility for St. Helier, and I want to continue to serve not only your interests, to create a better, fairer future for St. Helier and a better Jersey. Thank you very much indeed. And Southern. Good evening. It's good to be back home in St. Helier. Unfortunately, it's here that the inequalities of our island are most keenly felt. It's where people live in substandard housing, where immigration, if uncontrolled, will lead to overcrowding, where schools are having to deal with children who don't have English as their first language, and with young people who become disaffected through a range of social problems from poverty to drug taking. Mark Bolia said that Jersey schools should be outperforming those in the UK by a wider margin because this is a wealthy island without inner city problems. But we have those problems. We have children going to school hungry. We have children in overcrowded accommodation. We have a mental health system for children and young people that's not fit for purpose, leading to increasing suicides. The education service needs more funding, not less, to provide enough well-qualified specialist teachers to enable all children to reach their potential. We need more funding for our mental health services to cut down on waiting lists that can have damaging consequences and to provide good follow-up services. 6,000 people, 11% of our workforce, are on zero-hours contracts. Most of these are abusive. Workers have no hope of getting or keeping a mortgage, can't take on a lease, have no right to holiday pay or sickness pay. They don't know what their income will be each week. If they don't get enough work, they have to rely on food banks. Is this what we want to see in our wealthy society? Will this create the employee loyalty that would produ will produce productivity and growth? We have poverty because of our low-wage economy, and this costs the taxpayer millions a year in income support. Why should taxpayers fork out to prop up low-paying employers? Why should hard-working people have the indignity of claiming income support in order to survive? This is where savings should be made, not by cutting the services on which we all depend. We must put money in the hands of the lower paid whose increased spending will boost the economy if taxes are needed, they should come from very high earners. St. Helier is underrepresented in the States. 
We have one constable for a third of the island's population. Why are states building still not paying rates after years of campaigning by our constable? Reform Jersey has candidates in East di each district. Together we can make a difference. We can say no to the automatic right of constables to sit in the state. No to poverty wages. No to high rents. No to an abuse of zero hours contracts. No to tax rises for low and middle earners. No to cuts in our public services. If you want a fairer and a more equal society, vote for Reform Jersey. And for me, and Southern on Wednesday. Paul Routier. Uh, good evening. Uh, having lived and worked in uh, St. Helier all of my life, uh, I went to school at Vox, uh, Halker Place just down the road and Vauxhall just behind us. Uh, and then I went on to working uh, in the retail business around the town, predominantly in Bath Street. Uh, I have a good understanding of uh, what town life is, is like. Uh, St. Helia is the commercial heart of uh, our island and we do need uh, to do uh, something to enhance it because uh, not only for the business environment but also importantly for people's living standards uh, within our community. Uh, compared to many towns in, uh, in the UK and, and France, we, have a, we do have a vibrant town. Uh, however, however, living in town for some people can mean a lack of space and housing which, is, which does not meet acceptable standards. The housing transformation program which uh, Andrew Green brought forward will help to address some of those uh, issues, but uh, we do need to also encourage uh, private landlords to provide uh, uh, good quality accommodation. For many islanders, population is uh, a top priority. Uh, we know that uh, there are varying view, views across our community and uh, those, uh, th those of us who are concerned, for instance, about uh, green fields, uh, school capacity, availability of housing, unemployment, uh, and there's also the, the wealth generators uh, amongst us uh, and the, the businesses who require uh, appropriately qualified staff. Uh, the control of housing and work law is deliberately structured to find a balanced approach to decisions about controlling access to housing and, uh, and work. Uh, we are now seeing the uh, results of the effectiveness of the new law coming through with more local people in work and less registered people who have been uh, here under five years uh, in working in our community. It is not only the effectiveness of the law that has achieved this, but uh, it's the fantastic support of uh, some employers working in the, in the back, with the Back to Work team. Uh, I must emphasise that the, we are open for business. Uh, we do want to encourage uh, new businesses to the island and entrepreneurs. Uh, so it, we, that, that is one of the, of the priorities that, that we have. Um, I hope that I have shown during my time in the States that uh, I do have the skills, the compassion, and the ability to achieve things. And uh, if you uh, share that view, I hope you'll consider me for one of your votes. Thank you very much. Philip Balash. Good evening. Um, a month ago, I received a pamphlet from Caritas Jersey, the international Catholic charity, uh, which posed some big questions for all the candidates in the elections. Uh, I cannot deal with them all in three minutes, but one of them uh, say, was, uh, can Jersey be a community of opportunity for everyone? And my resounding answer to that is, yes, it can be, but perhaps it is not always so. Do we, the natives, really think about the needs of the immigrant communities? It is worrying that, um, with some honourable exceptions, uh, they do not really seem to engage in the political process. I had my um, haircut on uh, Saturday and I asked my uh, Jersey uh, Madeiran hairdresser what percentage of the Portuguese population she thought would vote in the elections. About 10% was the answer. If that is right, an important section of the electorate excludes itself. My election banner includes the words, please vote in the languages of the main immigrant communities in Jersey, Portuguese, Polish, Romanian, and French. 
but on reflection, an opportunity was missed in not having the manifesto or part of it translated into those uh, languages. If we want to continue as an inclusive and tolerant community, at ease with itself, we need to ensure that our legislature is uh, truly representative of all the people and that um, everyone has the opportunities that Jersey offers to prosper and succeed. I do not agree with many of the policies of the Reform Jersey Party, but it is entitled to credit for showing us a viable step in the democratic journey. Party politics in Jersey does not have to be negative and divisive, as it is in many other countries. We could have political parties which work with each other on policies that they share, but give the electorate clarity in fully developed party manifestos where there are differences of opinion. It is difficult to make informed choices based on a cacophony of sound bites from election posters and leaflets and a few minutes of hustings which only a small percentage of the uh, electorate attends. That may be one of the reasons why the immigrant communities and many young people too opt out. Jersey is a wonderful place, beautiful, vibrant, safe, and generally harmonious. It is a land of opportunity. And I am standing for election because I believe we need to make it a land of opportunity for everyone. Thank you very much. Conrad Krasinski. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Conrad Krasinski. Thank you for coming in such a large number. It really shows that you still have some faith in the good politicians. Um, this is the last casting for all of us before the election date. During all this time, we have been enchanted by exquisite diction, body language, and glamour of success. You may have seen the power of words cleverly covering up for failures of this government. You have seen smiles, squeezing, head, sorry, squeezing hands, and assurances of better future. Back then, as well as today, it is the last time they are here for you, and only few will remain truly faithful to their promises. Only few will leave the door open and listen to what you, the public, have to say. These doors will remain closed yet for another three years of the same administration, and you will simply remain passive observers, not having any real impact on your day-to-day -day life. Don't let the same people seize yet another opportunity to control their policy to their own advantage. Some candidates here will tell you they are very optimistic. Ladies and gentlemen, I am very optimistic too when I get into bed at night, hoping the next day the sun will shine. <laughs> Tonight, sitting here, you have to be realistic. This is not another Harry Potter world where you can fix anything with the touch of magic wand. Politics is the art of responsibility for other people, identifying needs and finding solutions. This is not just smiles and declaration of optimism. Politics is not flyers, posters, or phenomenal interviews on radio or television. And I do apologize for not giving any interviews to BBC and JEP yet. I'm sorry, I have a full-time job. Maybe there will be another opportunity to, to do the interview. Um, politics is hard work destined at serving public best. And I don't see best at all. I see the government, which represents financial classes, and the same government which wants financial sector to fly low and quietly below radars of other jurisdictions so that every effort to put Jersey on the map is effectively restrained by the same people who don't want Jersey to be noticeable. Perhaps some people will find my speech unpopular, but I don't come here to gain popularity in the rise. I'm honest and I'm having nothing to hide. I'm, I come here to serve you and solve problems they don't want to see. All we deserve is equal rights, affordable housing, and education, more support for small businesses, equal access to health ser healthcare services, and more support for most vulnerable. Do not, do not let those people, do not allow those, those problems to become another scenario for the next election leaflet in 2018. Let us be stronger and let us choose the new face of our politics. On the 15th of October, you have big responsibility. Let it be the day in which, after months of work of new assembly, you will be able to honestly say that the election day on the 15th of October was the day of success for all of us. Thank you. Alan McLean.
Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I've been in recent days canvassing in St. Helier and listening to the views of parishioners. Two issues came up repeatedly. The two-site hospital plan and the disgraceful decision by the state to reject the referendum on electoral reform. We must resolve these matters. I've served, ladies and gentlemen, as Minister for Economic Development since 2008, a period covering the most severe global financial crisis imaginable. I'm extremely proud to have had the opportunity to serve my island and our community on important local issues as well as on the international stage. I've worked hard together with colleagues to build Jersey's reputation abroad, developing trade links and securing inward investment as an essential way to diversify and boost our economy and create local job opportunities. And ladies and gentlemen, it's working. We've invested in supporting startup and small businesses across all sectors. They're the lifeblood of any community and economy. We've invested to boost innovation, new technology, creative and digital industries. As a result, the economy is improving and a number of sectors, including agriculture and tourism, returned to growth in 2013. We also integrated the harbour and airport, improving services and saving taxpayers a million pounds worth of unnecessary costs. Ports Incorporation will save taxpayers a further 193 million over the next 20 years. We reformed the Beach Lifeguard Service, appointing the RNLI, improving safety and cutting costs. <coughs> Importantly, 21 out of 23 Beach Lifeguards are now fully trained and qualified locals. We completely redesigned the ailing lottery and as a result raised £680,000 for charities, local charities, last year. That's a quarter of a million more than ever before. But there are still threats ahead and many islanders are still struggling to make ends meet. I want to increase efforts to lower the cost of living by strengthening the competition law and consumer groups and by improving competition in the market. This change alone will have significant effect on making life more affordable for islanders. I want to see the cost of government controlled rather than a soft option of tax rises that hurt islanders and the economy. I want to see income support reviewed and for a greater fairness and greater value. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm in politics because I care passionately about our island. If you want to be represented by someone with a strong and independent views, someone with a proven track record, experience, determination and vision to drive positive change, I ask you to consider giving me one of your votes next Wednesday. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I won't let you down. Sean Power. Good evening, St. Helier. Last but not least in the hustings. Um, it's a privilege to be here tonight. Um, and like five of my colleagues on this table tonight, um, they've served as deputies before they became senators. I believe that serving as a deputy in whatever electoral district is a perfect and very good grounding to become a senator. And I believe in the island-wide mandate. I believe in, um, in, in the fact that senators um, have served at, for a time in the Assembly, take responsibility for decisions and are answerable for them. I have served for the last six years on one of the great poison chalices of the States, and that is planning. Everyone loves to hate planning. I have reported for the last three years to Deputy de Hamill, which was a challenge in itself. I have also knitted together a team which composed of Oops, Deputy Bryan's up there, Deputy Le Harissier, Deputy Masson, Deputy Boda, and we've actually come out the other end with a degree of, um, we've passed, we passed the test, I think. Um, planning is a very difficult job, but I've done the best I can. Jersey is a community. Sir Philip said tonight that he had put part of his brochure into two languages or three languages. Um, I decided not to do that, I like going to a Portuguese cafe and talking to the Portuguese at Cheapside. I like buying Polish product in the Polish shops. In my little recovery house and shelter in New Street, we've got Polish, pop, Polish washing up liquid. I think we've got Polish pasta, work that one out. And we've got Polish coffee that you could stand a spoon up and it would probably strip the chrome on the spoon. We've actually lost some of the spoons. But so it's a community. And St. Helier is a community. 
St. Helier is our capital. Sometimes we feel from St. Brillard or anywhere that we forget how important St. Helier is. I spend most of my time in St. Helier now. I have an office in St. Helier. I run a shelter in St. Helier. I, make, I help men recover from mistakes in St. Helier. I made mistakes in St. Helier. I'm here tonight to say to you, impossible in three minutes, that I've done what I can in the last three, six, nine years, and I ask you tonight to consider me for one of your, your, your eight votes. What I've said in my brochure is a little bit of what I do. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to the candidates for all speaking within their three minutes. Uh, I didn't have to stop anybody. This happened last time I chaired the senatorial hustings, so well done. Uh, this is uh, St. Helier's hustings, and so now it's your turn, uh, St. Helier electors, to question the candidates. And we're going to be looking for three questions in the first instance. I'd like to take one from up there if we can, uh, preferably from someone who's not directly involved with any of the candidates or standing themselves. That would be helpful. Um, perhaps the uh, person there with the red uh, uh, headgear. Uh, and if uh, you could just give your name and say roughly where you live in St. Helier. Absolutely. We're going to take the first, I'll come back to you in a minute. If you could give your name and say roughly where you live in St. Helier, that would be great because I don't know you all yet by name. Uh, so we'll take a question from this side of the room. Yes, uh, gentlemen over there, please, the uh, sitting down. Yes, Mr. LeBrock, I do know your name, yes, okay. And we'll take uh, one from over this side of the room. Hands up. Yes, the gentleman with the beard uh, over there. And then we're going to go up there to the person with the red uh, headgear. I'm sorry, I can't tell at this distance uh, much more about you. So the, the, microphone, <laughs> the microphone is on its way, except that you're very young. The microphone <laughs> is on its way, and uh, we're going to start over here. Then we're going to go here. And then we're going to go up, up there to the balcony. The microphone, Eric, is on its way, is it? It's there. Good. OK. If you could keep the questions short, we'll have the three questions, and then we will go to the candidate number one to begin answering. Uh, I'll, the, the question posed to... Uh, um, what's his name? Uh, uh, Senator Ozef. Three years ago, I asked... I'm sorry, can I ask you to pose your question to all the candidates? All right. So they're all going to have to answer it. Thank you. An Thank you. Primarily to sent the Ozef. Three years ago, I asked you at the town hall, when were you going to get British Home Stores, um, Boots, and various other English companies to pay tax? I'm going to do it. That'll be one of my first things, is what you said. In three years... None of them are paying any tax whatsoever. When are you going to do something about it? And to start, the, the candidates, I'd like their opinions as well. Thank you very much. If you could stand up, sir, then it'll be easier for the microphone to find you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Julian Bryan. I live in St. Helier number one. Uh, my question is regarding the, the decision making in process in the States. The legislature can be described as inefficient at best and unfit for purpose at worst. Uh, the obvious answer is to reform the House. And after years, absolutely, uh, last year's absolutely laughable uh, referendum that we had, what did the candidates propose to do about States reform to improve the way that decisions are made? Thank you very much. And up on the balcony. Uh, Jan Mash, um, St. Helier, three and four. Um, um, sorry, <laughs> just a bit nervous. Um, voter turnout in Jersey is actually horrendous and it's really, really low, especially compared to, especially with young people. So um, I was wondering what would the candidates do anything about that and would they do adopt anything like the Brazilian model where everyone has to vote? Thank you. Thank, thanks very much for those first three questions. Um, English companies or mainland stores, what would candidates do to make them pay tax? Uh, Decision-making 
what will the candidates do about states' reform to make decision-making more efficient, and voter turnout, uh, particularly among young people, what will candidates do to increase voter turnout? And we start with Chris McGee. Thank you. I'd like to answer the questions in reverse order, if I may. Um, as a member of the youth, I know all too well that there is a very large percentage of people who just switch off completely when the word politics is mentioned. Why is that? Well, I've been speaking to a lot of them during the course of my campaign, and the, the most popular answer is, well, these people don't represent me. They don't represent the youth, so why should I bother? So they don't go out and vote, and then the people that get in don't represent them, and the vicious cycle continues. I think that the best thing to, to encourage young people is actually have candidates that, you know, care about the young people. Um, and it sort of ties into the second question. I don't think that people should be forced to go out and vote. I don't think that people should be forced to do anything, really. But um, the best way to, to have an accountable legislature is to get rid of the people when, when they, they, they don't perform. And the best way you can do that is at, is at the ballot box. Um, accountability in terms of, of states' decisions. I myself, which you might have seen in my manifesto, after every decision and every vote that I make in the state's chamber, I'll upload a short video to YouTube explaining why I did what I did to, to increase transparency and accountability. Foreign companies should pay tax in Jersey. There's no, there's no reason that I see that you know, the likes of Boots and all the other multinationals come over here and effectively undercut local Jersey businesses. We need to do more to protect local Jersey businesses because they are the economy. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Ian Gorse. Uh, thank you. Three uh, meaty questions. The first one, uh, I love uh, elections because you get to hear what people are thinking about issues. And throughout this election, uh, there are two issues which have been in conflict with each other that many candidates have spoken about. And one is extracting value from UK trading companies here that don't pay tax, like all other companies. And the other is uh, everybody lining up to say they don't like the property tax review. Why do I bring them together? Because the property tax review at its heart was about trying to extract value from those UK trading companies and trying to find a way of delivering that through property because they have to occupy properties. It was Europe Rumpia that first suggested that this might be um, a solution. So we are working on a solution and it's included in the property tax review. So we need to let that come to uh, fruition because I know that it is an important issue and we need to grapple it to the ground. Uh, changes to uh, the electoral system. Um, currently, electoral form is dealt with by a committee of the states. That's got to change. It's got to come into the domain of the executive. They've got to take control of it, and they've got to start delivering for it. I spoke about the electoral reform at St Mary's Hustings. Voter turnout. We're going to encourage young people to uh, get out and vote. I believe one of the ways is through setting up a youth parliament, and you might have heard uh, a young person talking about that on the BBC uh, this morning. I go into schools to talk to young people about our system and try to encourage them to vote. It's important. We've got Thank to you very it. much. Thank you. Uh, Jeff Habin. Mr. LeBrock, yes, UK companies in King Street. I mean, King Street is some King, King Street, Queen Street is some 600 yards long, and I think there's only about six or seven local companies in it. Um, as we've heard, yes, the property tax will address it. Uh, unfortunately, taking it on on a blanket roll also brings in every other non-domiciled company in the, in, the, in the island, which includes all the banks, so we have to be a little bit careful on that one, but it is something that definitely comes up virtually every hustings, and we do need to do something about it. Uh, Mr. Brian, reform. Uh, yes, firstly, we need to listen to the constable's poll on Wednesday, as opposed to that which we did on the referendum, which was, quite honestly, was a slap in the face to the whole public. Um, but we need to, we, we do, we just need to get on with it. We actually need to take it seriously. Uh, it, it, we've been talking about it for some 14 years, if not longer. Uh, let's grasp the, the nettle. Let us do something about it. But it does mean that we actually have to sit down and be serious. Young people, well, I'm now 60, and I can remember that being spoken about 40 years ago, because I was saying that, what about us youngsters? Um, Yes, Australia, France have mandatory voting, but until we build trust in the Assembly, we're not going to achieve anything. Because trust isn't just about the older generation, it's right the way through, where people can believe they're being 
heard and that their voice actually has some meaning. And that is the first thing we have to do. Then we can take it from there. David Richardson. Um, with regards to taxes of the local companies, uh, what boots and people in Jersey, I think we should go back to the old system of uh, uh, separating their income in Jersey and taxing them in proportion like everybody else. I don't believe the property tax will necessarily work because it will tax uh, those who also have rented accommodation for people in the island who are renting accommodation. And I believe that's going to be unfair because it would increase the rents to those people. Um, with regards to legislation and reforming the states, um, the plain yes, no answer that's coming out will make it a lot simpler. Uh, as for keeping the uh, states less rowdy, we have a good bailiff who's a very good referee, keep him. Uh, shorten the debate times, maybe obligatory. As for voting turnout of younger people, I used to go into the schools quite frequently and take charities in. I think if we had a very effective person go into the state, into schools, and actually explain to them in a way that's amenable and fun, this would be great for, the, uh, for, the, for those people in the seat. We need to explain to them topics, how to vote, show them the voting paper. I think also that you should be taught certain instruments of life, like mortgages, APR, and certain bookkeeping facilities. This would help them engage with what politics and what everyday life is about. Thank you. Zoe Cameron. I think the problem with the corporate tax set at zero is because we have to compete in, against places like Dublin and other places and it's actually the fact that we moved and to introduce that so quickly meant that we have kept some of our finance industry here but it isn't fair and um, I think we do need to look at ways that we can address that so that some of the revenue is got, um, got back and, and uh, there's a level playing field with local companies. As far as decision making goes within the states, um, I think at the moment it's very much in silos between departments. There's not enough joined up government that wastes a lot of time so that whereas one area of development is going on, planning is in a different direction and we waste an awful lot of time. The two-site hospital is, an, is a very good example of that. So I'd be looking for a far more joined up government and proper um, debate early on in the processes. Um, the chief officers and, and politicians, you know, can't know everything in this very much more complex world. So we need to set aside this sort of feudal hierarchy. We don't know where the ideas are going to come from. And I think we've yet to fully harness the energy and expertise and enthusiasm of frontline workers. When it comes to, um, to improving the voter turnout, I think that... That, that's the result. If you, if you just leave your decision-making to an elite, then a lot of the population feel there's no point and they're not listened to. So by improving engagement, then hopefully people will turn out to vote in the polls. Thank you. Andrew Green. Of course we must find a way of getting English companies to pay tax. Why is it not, that, not fair that, uh, say, Normans, owned, I believe, by a French company, pays no tax, and yet Romerals, owned by local people, pay tax. And I would have thought a very simple way of doing that would be to uh, have some sort of commercial rate that, local, that applies to all companies, but local companies paying tax can offset that against their tax. I would have thought that was quite simple, and the non-local companies paying no tax costs can't offset it. We need a level playing field. I'd go one step further, which might surprise you, uh, and um, not only have the rates for the state's buildings, but I'd have state's uh, departments paying rent for their properties. Time and time again, I see a case made for a property that's no longer fit for purpose. They get the new one and they continue to run the old one because there's no cost to them for so doing. Commercial organisations would get rid of it if there was a cost, and that's the sort of approach I'd like to see there. State's reform, it's my question about the constables because I want to hear from you. Referendums have to be a yes or no. We saw that in Scotland. They're not some sort of multi-choice 
question paper like or, or show like who wants to be a millionaire. Referendums must be clear, must say yes or no. And this is the first step. So we must reform ourselves. We must get things done. For young people, well, I'm still involved with young people. I still chair the Scouts Association. I spent 48 hours standing in town trying to engage with all of the community, but particularly young people. Problem is, they don't understand our system. Thank you very much. I did pay. Uh, in my manifesto, I say back off on taxes, but the one exception I most certainly would make uh, is looking at how we tax people who are outside this island but retain interest within it. That does need to be dealt with. We need to switch the taxation burden onto areas that can afford it more easily. I, I don't agree that the State's Assembly is a rotten decision-making body. Actually, I think it does it reasonably well, uh, given who you put in there. Um, the... Um, the issue, uh, the issue is who is in there? Uh, my form is very straightforward. Uh, the island-wide mandate is undoubtedly the fairest system. I would have 30 senators, 12 constables representing the parishes, and I would abolish the deputies. Get rid of them. Now, as for turnout, getting young people to vote on election day, it's very simple. Shut down the mobile phone network, close the internet. <laughs> <coughs> Uh, and send vigilante groups to, uh, to confiscate all Xboxes. That's how you do it. Look, if you want to get interested, young folk, get involved. But I can assure you, when I was young, there were plenty of things a heck of a lot more interesting than getting involved in politics. Leave it to the white-haired people, for goodness sake. Um, and by the way, turnout doesn't matter. I'd rather we had 5,000 people who knew what on earth they were doing than make it compulsory and people just come in. How many votes have we got? Right, first eight boxes, bang, bang, bang. It's easy peasy. If you want turnouts, make it compulsory, but you don't need to. Thank you. And Sarah Ferguson. Right, um, I'm sorry, everybody's getting it wrong. The utilities pay tax at 20%, finance companies pay at 10%, all other companies don't pay tax, whether they're local or whether they're foreign ones. And since the deemed distribution was removed, um, people can leave profits in their companies and that won't get taxed or the tax is delayed. We need a proper review, not just bringing in property taxes. The concept of centralizing rates, you know, it just makes my hair stand on end. Um, states reform, originally this referendum was going to be, do you want clothier or don't you? And then it got amended by the states and watered down. Um, one of the problems making decisions better is scrutiny working more effectively. Scrutiny is working more effectively, but ministers don't always want it there. And they sort of, or I don't know, it's the ministers or the, cent or the civil servants, they tend to forget scrutiny, or it gets its, um, it has a shortened length of time to actually do its reports. Um, I think we've had two very good reviews recently, the hospital review, which means they've got to come back to the states and debate the two-centre hospital concept, and I think the budget one has really opened up the de uh, debate on the economy, and, you know, I just happen to be involved with both of them. Um, Thank you. <laughs> Lyndon Farnham. <clears throat> I too think we really do need to find a way to extract some extra value from uh, UK companies, but of course um, the, the issue on who, which companies pay, pays tax has been uh, straightened out. But we must also remember that all companies in Jersey, especially the larger um, employers, provide a very valuable contribution to the economy in our society. They collect GST and they provide jobs and pay social security for their employees. So on the balance of things, they do a lot more good uh, for us, but we must find a way to try and extract some more value uh, from them. Uh, what are we going to do about states reform? Well, we just simply need the states to find a consensus, but I don't think that's uh, going to happen sometime soon simply because we need to... Um, the balance of the Assembly, I, I think, is, is not going to be 
um, favourable to make the changes uh, we want. Gaia said we should, uh, uh, you know, get rid of deputies. I think that's a step too far. I'm going to support a model that keeps a senator, and I will not. I'm sorry that I voted against the result of the referendum, but I'm not going to support anything that removes the island-wide mandate without your permission um, first, and you weren't given that option. So I'm going to support a model that keeps the senators, keeps the constable, and has a reduced number of uh, uh, deputies. I don't know how we can make, make um, politics sexy, can I use that word for, for the young people, um, but perhaps rather than switch the internet off, we should, should engage in the internet, make young people vote on the internet. That's an idea. Thank you. John Young, we have to find a way of altering 010 um, tax structure. When we brought it in, we didn't think about operating companies who are owned off sea, overseas, they employ people here locally, and they pay those dividends to other, to overseas, and they pay tax in those countries, and leave costs here locally of social security costs, housing costs, hospital costs of their employees. And it's, of course, worse when you have low-wage employees where taxpayer is paying income support to pay that. That has to be dealt with. It's a disincentive to local businesses, uh, locally owned businesses. On ministerial reform, I think the, the way government's work has changed when we had committees. We wouldn't have a situation where the two-site hospital has almost got to the point of signing the contract and then we suddenly find we're going to have a state's debate to make the decision because people are unhappy about it two years later. No, we've got to have involvement of other members, involvement of the public, um, have that communication in place. Um, and there were things that can be done with the ministerial systems to make it better. So uh, we have to uh, reform it. Electoral reform, yes, I think we have to. That has been really difficult. I've seen it in action. Um, I think the referendum will uh, take us forward. I will go with the result, whatever it is. Um, on the question of voter engagement, I think part of the problem is people feel um, not connected with government as a result of we have to involve them. Young people, we've got to get into the schools and the schools have been defensive about educating youngsters in real politics. I think they've got to stop that and um, make them you know, face the real world like I did when I was 17. Thank you. Malcolm Ferry. Thank you. Um, yeah, small local businesses in particular are the backbone of our economy. If they're operating on an unlevel playing field, how are they expected to thrive and to survive? Local businesses keep what they do locally, they bring money into, into the economy locally, and it stays locally. So we have to find a way of allowing them to operate on a more level playing field. Um, in relation to the referendum result, I'm all for looking forwards. Uh, you know, I've spoken to a lot of people who were really angry about the way the last referendum was dealt with, but we have a yes-no referendum now. Once we get the answer to that, that will be our building block for moving forward, because at least we will know the answer to the question whether or not the constables are going to stay in the States. Then we can move on to find how we're going to move, reform the rest of the, the Assembly. Uh, in relation to voter turnout, again, I, I think that social media is a great way of reaching people, as well as all the other traditional methods. I think e-voting could quite easily be done. Of course, there's some security issues around it, but it's not impossible, and I'm sure that will be in place in the very near future. So um, I don't like the, the idea of forcing people to vote. Somehow that feels counterintuitive to me. I think you have to have a free will of whether or not you want to vote. If you force people to vote, you end up probably with a bunch of spoiled papers. And does that really tell you anything else that you need to know? Thank you. Philip Ozef. Uh, Mr Le Brock, uh, I feel just as strongly as you do, sir, about uh, this issue about the states, uh, about uh, low, uh, foreign companies paying tax. Uh, I said in my opening remarks uh, that my work ethic is this to be the first one in and the last one out. And nobody in this room uh, lets you believe that there is an easy solution to this issue. Uh, because there isn't. It's easy for politicians to say at election time, oh, I can find a solution. The reality is, is that when, the, when you're given the facts, and the facts, Mr Richardson, are that we cannot go to that old system, uh, we can simply must compete. 
Now, that property tax review, which has been uh, portrayed in the media um, as an ab abolition of the rate system, which I don't want to see, actually has a solution to that. And I'm hopeful that there's going to be a consultation that will deliver that. I want to cut taxes for lower and middle income people and make it fairer, which is why I cut the marginal rate of tax in last year's budget. In relation to the states, uh, well, um, the states is sclerotic. Uh, the states takes too long. Uh, and why do people not vote? Well, people don't vote uh, because people don't think that their vote actually is going to be delivered uh, and actually going to mean anything uh, for uh, themselves. Uh, the representation, the representatives you want need to listen and then work on your behalf. Uh, and that's what's going to improve the standards of democracy. And that's why I've been listening and working and doing extra Q&As right the way through this election customs campaign. I'm better informed in order to represent you and to make the island a better and fairer place on your behalf. That's the way you deliver. I've got a track record of hard work and delivery, even though sometimes people don't like the, sometimes the truth that one has to say about the reality of the difficult decisions we make. Thank you very much. And Southern. Thank you. If I may take the questions in reverse order, uh, people don't vote because they don't feel their vote will make a difference. And with uh, 17 members of the states, including 11 constables elected unopposed, you can see why. Democracy depends on being able to eject one lot with one set of policies and vote in another lot with another set of policies. And for this, you need political parties, each with a distinct set of principles and a leader who'll be chief minister. Then we could be invited into schools, we would have balance, and we would be able to explain our policies clearly to young people and to older people. I don't think we should force people to vote. Uh, there's been continued debate on reform. States members shouldn't be doing it. They have too many vested interests. Clothier was an independent commission that offered a coherent vision, which included political parties to make it work, and we should accept Clothier. Uh, in terms of uh, the uh, tax, the OECD forced this on us in order for the brass plate companies to continue their tax-free status. Um, so it's very, very difficult to raise tax on foreign-owned company. On, yes, but, but in fact, I do agree with uh, Senator Osef on this, that there is mileage in the property tax. I don't agree with most of the things in it, but that might be a way of getting foreign-owned companies to pay something into our economy. Uh, thank you. Uh, I need to declare an interest as a, a retailer in town and uh, uh, in competition with some of these uh, UK companies, so I'll make that very clear. And, but I, do, I, I believe that they do need to, we need to find a way to extract some funds out of them. And I did see it in the property review t the tax uh, in, the, uh, in that document, and I think there is uh, an opportunity there to, to get some money. We mustn't forget that they, those companies, English companies, do actually pay GST. Uh, same as every other company. They're not getting away scot-free because they do pay tax in their home, home countries. Uh, with regard to um, reforming the state, it was an absolute disgrace that the referendum was uh, thrown out last time. Uh, I was one of the ones who supported that uh, we should accept uh, the outcome of the referendum. Um, we, what I have found with regard to reform is the states have actually spent far too much time talking about ourselves and not enough about dealing with issues that are in our community, think about social issues. And uh, we need to get on with social reform uh, rather than actually reforming ourselves, from my point of view. Uh, with regard to uh, voter turnout, uh, some of us do go into schools and, uh, and speak to, uh, we're invited in to speak to, uh, to, to some classes about various things, and we, we go along and do that. Um, the Youth Assembly, which uh, happens once a year, I think we should be doing that on a more regular basis, once a month. Uh, because there is a lot of energy from the, the younger generation who, who do enjoy coming into our assembly and having their own debates. And I think we should continue, that, continue to do that. Primary schools come in every week. Various uh, different Paris uh, school comes in. I, I, I hope we do more of that. Thank you. Uh, Philip Balash. What, what is uh, very unfair is that individual traders pay no income tax, whereas businesses owned by companies next door um, uh, pay no tax. And it's made even worse if the company is a United Kingdom company, because that company pays uh, tax in the UK, but pays no tax in Jersey. 
Um, this system was in part forced upon us by the European Union and the United Kingdom government, and it was the price that we had to pay for keeping the finance industry in Jersey. We needed a tax-neutral option so that uh, uh, overseas investors could uh, put their money in Jersey, and that was the only way to achieve it. Um, we do sometimes get bullied, and although I agree with other speakers that there is no easy solution to this problem, I do think that we ought to be more prepared to stand up for ourselves internationally for what is in Jersey's interests. Um, so far as the referendum is concerned, I don't think there was anything wrong with it, actually. There were two clear questions which were understood by almost everybody except uh, some uh, members on this platform. Um, and uh, the people voted in favour of one of, uh, of the two reform options. Uh, the scandal was that states' members, or a majority of them, uh, rejected the option for which the people had, in fact, voted. Um, when we, if uh, re-elected, I will obviously try to work for consensus in the new assembly. Thank you. Conrad Krasinski. Um, ladies and gentlemen, in relation to question number three, the voters turnout, um, I think the way to begin this process must start at schools. Um, I can tell you something about poor turnout. I can count on one of my hand, one, my one hand, the number of Polish people attending this hosting tonight. And this, is, this indifference in politics is appalling. It shows that somewhere on the way we have failed. We have failed to educate young people on the importance of voting and politics. Politics is everywhere and we cannot escape from it. And why would we anyway? It teaches us solidarity and commitment to society. If you want to see more young people engaged in politics, we also need to change our attitude uh, towards politics. And you, ladies and gentlemen, are the best example of it. So when we meet in 2018, I want to see parents and children together, not just parents. This is how you involve young people in politics. In many EU countries, voting is compulsory and they impose financial sanctions on those who don't. And that's the way to go. If there's poor turnout. Um, no tax for overseas companies operating is simply immoral and disgraceful. How do you imagine small local companies to compete in such a circumstances? I am deeply convinced that it kills small businesses and makes them uncompetitive um, against bigger companies. Um, small businesses still have to put up with GST, rent and taxes. So what happens? Um, they have to put their prices up and what happens after that? Amazon.com. Alan McLean. Uh, thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'll take the questions in reverse order. Number three, um, about uh, how to improve uh, voter turnout. Uh, quite simply, a better decision making by the states is going to improve voter turnout. And I'll give you a really good example. It's called referendum. If we ask you a question and then we ignore it, do we expect you to come out and vote? No, it's not the way to deal with it. There are other things we can do, of course. Places like Estonia, 34% of votes of the last um, elections they had were cast online. Online voting has to be the way to go, in my view. I'd like to see a youth parliament. There's one in the offing, and I hope we uh, manage to develop that. I think that would be very encouraging, being uh, presented by a young lady from one of the schools. Um, as far as question two is concerned in decision-making, part of what I've said applies. Referendum, we could have made it binding, but we should have uh, listened to what you had to say in the first place. Electoral reform, uh, an independent commission, is my view uh, a way that could have improved that. But the real issue, ladies and gentlemen, is about public sector reform. What we have to do is make sure uh, departments are more efficient and more effective, don't operate in silos as they currently do, uh, and we've got to ensure, therefore, that we get things like costs down. Uh, and we can do it if we change the structure. Structure is key. As far as UK companies are concerned, there's got to clearly be fairness. These companies, it's what the shareholders do with the revenues that they get from the island. They take it off island in most cases. But they are nevertheless important, these UK companies. They employ a lot of local people. They do pay taxes, the employees here. But we do have to get fairness in the system. There is a solution. Thank you. Sean Power. Um, the first question, Sir Philip said tonight that uh, we are bullied by London and Brussels. We are. And Jersey local owned, locally owned trading companies are at a disadvantage because of that. So Jersey trading companies that are subsidiaries of UK and other multiples don't have to pay tax. 
So the Jersey company is at a disadvantage and we need to fix that. And we, I actually say it in, in my little brochure that we need to revise tax policy for Jersey trading companies and define separation of those in finance and those outside. And that relates to the ownership. That's the first bit. So that's been grossly fair. And I've said this in the States on a number of occasions. States debate and states decisions. I am withered from, um, from listening to some appalling speeches and some, as Sir Philip said tonight, some complete time-wasting debates. Um, the state is incapable of reforming itself, as far as I'm concerned, and the sooner we actually decide that we, we as, a, as a group, our day, the next assembly um, agrees that it has to be done from outside, I would think that that's the only way. Voter, voter um, participation, those in their 20s, 30s and 40s, they're used to smartphones, iPads, Wi-Fi, broadband, internet, online banking, Amazon and Xboxes, as somebody said. We then asked them to go into a plywood box with a pencil on a string. <laughs> I agree with Alan McLean. We need to reform and we need to invite people in. But what we also need to do is put some passion. Like, if you, anyone saw the, the Scottish referendum, 85% turned out. We're lucky to get 25 in some of these. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to the candidates for those answers. We're now going to take a second uh, group of three questions uh, from St. Helier electors. I'd like you to give your name, please, and tell us uh, where you live in the parish, roughly. Um, and we're going to start in the middle of the uh, table so that the same people don't have to start first. I'm going to start with the, uh, Mr. Robert Shaw, I think your name is, with the brown T-shirt. The microphone is on its way to you. Uh, we haven't had any women asking any questions yet, which is a little disappointing. Um, behind the pillar. Behind the pillar. Right. Yes, thank you. Uh, just take the lady behind the pillar over there, please, with your hand up. Uh, next. And I'm going to take someone up on the balcony, the gentleman in the middle with his hand up. Uh, thirdly, that's great. So let's start with Mr. Robert Shaw. Uh, ask your question, please. Uh, yeah, thank you. Good evening. My name is Christian Robert Shaw, and I live at Charing Cross. I'd like to know what all of the candidates' positions are on the implementation of a proper living wage, please. Um, good evening, my name is Alexandra, I live in St. Helier. I would like to ask a question about the planning and uh, building regulations as I found these um, harmful to ordinary people nowadays. For example, not being able to change single glazed windows into the double glazed ones, even at our own expenses. Hence the question, is there anything that can be done about that? And um, if yes, uh, what are your ideas on the problems? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Alexandra. Can I just ask you to be a little bit more specific about what in the planning or building regulations you would like the candidates to, to um, answer. Sorry, I'm going to move. Um, basically, as, as I said, it's, it's for example about the windows changing from the single glazed to the double glazed or dealing with the interiors or on, of the listed uh, buildings as I'm aware that that's a part of the heritage. But um, we can't do anything about that. We can't change anything. Uh, that's why I just want to ask about that. Thank you very much for that clarif done? clarification. What, yes, I'll explain that in a minute. And, yes. um, my name is Patrick Cullinane. I live in number three district, St. Helier. I would like to ask, of the questions asked um, during the senatorial uh, hustings this year, the various questions that have been asked, I'd like to ask each candidate which one of those questions did they find most difficult to answer and why? This one, by the way, doesn't count as one of the questions. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Just to recap for the benefit of the uh, audience and the candidates, uh, three questions. Firstly, what will the candidates do to uh, bring in a living wage? Uh, secondly, what will they do about uh, onerous planning uh, and building regulations, for example, in respect of changing windows and other changes to listed buildings? Uh, and thirdly, which question in the senatorial hustings have they found most difficult apart from that one? And we start with uh, John Young. <laughs> Thank you. Um, on the question of listed buildings, uh, well, the current planning minister has embarked upon a review 
He's been at it for three years, but it hasn't produced the results, and the complaints are kind of stacking up. There's no question there's major conflicts between the listed requirements of buildings and energy conservation, for example, and often in the practicality of buildings. And so we need to be more selective in our policies and to ensure that you know, we, there is a, an important role for common sense. Often we find that that can be exercised, but people have to spend a lot of money on bureaucratic approaches in order to get that addressed. And I'm fully hopeful that that review can be sorted out in the next states uh, with the right minister. On the question of a living wage, well, I'm not a great expert on this, but because we do have a minimum wage, but I'm quite clear that's not enough for our high costs in Jersey, if in many, many cases. I'm very interested in the Mayor of London, Boris Johnson, who has actually launched this campaign about living wage and with some great success. So I think there's something in it, but I don't think it can be done as compulsory. On the question of which question is the hardest, for me it was at St Martin. I've listed these questions down, we've got about 70 questions so far. Gigabit Jersey, somebody asked about upload and download speeds. What does the difference mean as far as business opportunities concerned? I have to confess I didn't know. I went away and found out, and if I had time, I could tell you all about it. But it was a tough number. <laughs> Malcolm Ferry. Thank you. OK, Robert, in relation to a living wage, um, I have a seat on the Employment Forum, which makes recommendations to the Minister for Social Security on minimum wage. And let's get the two distinct differences. Minimum wage has a force of law. Living wage is a voluntary thing that people sign up to. So whilst I think it's good to put more money in people's pockets and that the way that filters through the economy, um, it, doesn't, it wouldn't have the force of law. But perhaps what we could do is if there was a, a, a living wage introduced, we could encourage states' departments to only deal with people who paid the, minimum, uh, the, the living wage. And that way it would permeate through the economy. Um, in, Alexander, in relation to planning regulations, uh, lists of buildings, of course, are very important to protect. Um, and I said in my opening address that you know, any development should be in line with the existing surroundings and not to the detriment of the natural beauty of our island. So that's, that's my thinking on that one. The most difficult question that I've had to answer, quite early on at St John, there was a question about the property tax, which was very deep and detailed, and I, I didn't have sufficient knowledge. I, I had an overarching idea of what the property tax was about, but I didn't have sufficient knowledge to answer the question in great detail. And uh, what, the first thing I did when I got home is I read through the green paper to make sure that I'd availed myself of all the relevant information. Thank you. Philip Ozov. Thank you, Mr. Constable. Uh, living wage, I, I understand these arguments very well, I think. I mean, you are correct that the living wage is designed to protect uh, those at the lowest earning levels, uh, marginalised groups, uh, women, um, uh, if it's not too sensitive to say immigrant workers, uh, those uh, people with disabilities. Those are the real issues uh, that people are faced with with low wages, and I understand that. And the way that you actually get um, I think wages up is when you are confident, uh, when you are confident uh, in investing in businesses, when people actually believe uh, that they can invest uh, and employ people at rates of, of pay, which is also uh, meaning that they will make profits. Uh, so I like, uh, for example, uh, the activities of Waitrose, social, uh, social enterprise. Waitrose employees actually get a stake in their business. I think there's lots of things to do. I'm not uh, against it at all. I think it's an important debate. Planning, it's a few years since I've been in planning, madam. Uh, I started the process of deregulating uh, and stopping things like uh, planning consents for uh, boilers, uh, uh, etc. Uh, and I think that there's a lot more that can be done. The most difficult question? Um, well, it's the question that hasn't been asked, actually. Uh, it's the question of how one is portrayed. Uh, and I realised that um, through this campaign that many people have got an image of me uh, which is hard finance, a bit too determined, uh, very focused on everything uh, that is money and other things. And this campaign hasn't given me the opportunity of answering the question uh, really that well, lots of people want to know, uh, which is actually what are these candidates really about? I'm actually quite human, Thank uh, despite you. the fact that other people uh, might not see that. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Southern.
Thank you. I think I made it clear from my speech that I believe that we should be moving towards a living wage because so much taxpayers' money goes in income support uh, to enable people to live in Jersey. Uh, one of our sitting members has uh, already uh, got a proposition through that this is going to be investigated. I don't think it can be made compulsory. The minimum wage can be made compulsory and is moving towards 45% of the average wage. But I think there should be a strong inducement to employers to pay the living wage. Um, in terms of onerous planning regulations, I tend to think some are too onerous. I know of uh, somebody living in the country with a house that's miles from the road and they've got rattling sash windows and they're not allowed to do anything about it because of planning regulations. I believe in preserving what's beautiful from the past, but I don't think we should preserve old buildings just for the sake of it. There are some very ugly ones that that I believe shouldn't be there. Um, the most difficult question, well, I think it's about gigabytes too. And I've done my homework for these elections. I've read uh, the Green Paper on Property. I've read the CAMS report. I've done a lot of reading. But when I hear gigabyte, I go bzzz. And that's the advantage of a political party because we specialise it. In, and I leave it to the younger members of our party to get their heads around that and tell me what I need to know. <laughs> And Paul Routier. Uh, with regard to living wage, I, I was uh, the, the Social Security Minister who brought in the legislation for the minimum wage, and, uh, and it's, as um, uh, Malcolm Ferry said, that he, was, uh, uh, he is part of the, the group that actually looks at the level each year. Uh, and so uh, I, I understand the need to have a, a, a way... A, a, funds for people to live on. The living wage is going to be reviewed and to see if we can introduce that. It will need to be, um, it can't be a compulsory thing, it, it would be, it's been quite successful in London, it's been identified and if we could encourage uh, as many businesses as possible who are able to pay the living wage that would certainly be a, a good step forward. Uh, with regard to um, the building, uh, planning and building regulations, there are some anomalies which do need to be resolved. Uh, the particular one you talk about has, I know, been a, a bit of, a, a bit of uh, contention over it for many people, and I, I hope you managed to resolve your particular, uh, your particular issue. I probably haven't got an answer for you how you're going to do it, but uh, uh, good luck with that. Um, the, the most difficult question was at the rural um, uh, thing, but we were asked about EU subsidies. I didn't have a, an idea about that at all. But I have to say the most challenging thing we had to, that we're having to discuss is the funding for health in the future. Uh, that's something we're all going to have to face. Um, and what we were being asked to do is how we can see a, a health um, uh, scheme going forward in the future and it's, we're really going to have to put a lot more funds into it to ensure that uh, we do have a correct health system. Okay. <laughs> Philip Balash. Um, well, I agree with uh, a lot of what has been said about a living wage. It's an aspiration and if we can encourage employers to pay a living wage, um, uh, so much the, uh, the better. What we have to be careful about, I think, is that we don't make life uh, so difficult for businesses, including small businesses, that uh, employment becomes uh, difficult and unemployment goes up. I personally think that unemployment is the greater evil, particularly for people in their 50s and 60s who really want to work but cannot find a job. Um, so far as the uh, planning issue is concerned, I think that the island plan is the key document and providing that uh, proposed plans comply with the island plan, I would like to see much greater discretion given to officials uh, to enable them to take um, minor decisions sometimes and to take them quickly uh, in the interests of those who are applying for permission. Um, the most difficult question, um, I think, probably, and it's only happened once, I think, during the hustings, uh, was uh, what the candidates thought about uh, gay marriage. And uh, I find that difficult because, um, on the one hand, I feel very strongly that uh, the society should not discriminate against citizens on any ground, particularly uh, gender orientation. On the other hand, all my life I've been brought up to believe that marriage is a union between a man and a woman, and uh, the churches have that teaching too. So I, uh, I hope that uh, the Chief Minister's consultation will help us resolve that in due course. Uh, Conrad Kalinsky. 
as uh, Zhong Yang already said, we have a minimum wage, but uh, this doesn't, um, uh, in some cases, enough to cover day-to-day uh, -day expenses. Um, I'm not a financial expert, but it seems obvious to me that current minimum wage is way below any standards, and therefore there should be another review done to examine what the real minimum wage should be. Um, in relation to building regulations, um, um, I see it as a one law for upper classes and another for ordinary people. I see inequality. I know for a fact that there are some politicians in Jersey who don't comply with the listed building regulations. So some of you people have to put up with freezing cold at winter time, whereas they can enjoy the benefits of double glazed windows, although they are not allowed um, in those buildings. Um, so let us take our neighbors in France. We have, you, you've been to Paris, most of you, and the whole heart um, is the heritage, beautifully combined with glass. So we need to take easy, uh, there's a lot, lot to improve towards the current re regulations, not just uh, windows in general, um, but um, we need, as I said, we need to go easy and use common sense with building regulation because living is not about um, what is on the paper, but about real people. Thank you. Alan McLean. Uh, thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, a living wage should be uh, quite clearly the aspiration that we should seek to uh, meet and we should seek to ensure that businesses within our island also do their utmost to be able to deliver it. How do we do that? We ensure we have a successful economy because if the economy is successful and it's growing, then businesses tend to pay better wages. Um, but we've got to follow what's happening in the UK. We can see over there that there are more and more companies actually paying what's deemed to be a living wage. And I think that's exactly the way that it should be. There is the competitive issue. We need to be conscious about uh, forcing, which of course uh, this isn't, it's an aspiration, companies to apply costs because of course it feeds through to consumer prices. But I think we can get there. Um, as far as building is concerned, madam, uh, the building regulations need to be balanced, they need to be fair, and I think we need to take uh, a far more pragmatic view in the way in which that's delivered. Uh, for example, uh, as far as planning is concerned, both social, environmental and economic factors should be taken into consideration, but it's the application that is absolutely key, and I think there's work that needs to be done with the planning department in that effect. So the most difficult question, it's around immigration and population. It's on everybody's mind. It matters most to islanders trying to keep Jersey special. We have to recognise that uh, immigration, some immigration, good immigration is necessary, high value because it creates jobs, but we have to do more to limit it. And the housing and works law that's been introduced is a step in the right direction, but there's a lot more that needs to be done. It's always a difficult question. Thank you. Yeah, um, on, on living wage, it's an aspiration, it's a voluntary code, for want of a better phrase. But when you ha the problem really is, the, is, is population and migration. When you have an entry-level job structure where people come into a cash in hand and a grey economy and only ever appear in the system when they end up um, at A&E or in the court system or, or a child turns up at school, um, those that want and companies that want to aspire to the living wage are undermined by the other sector of the economy. And it's a real issue. Um, with regard to planning and building regs, um, single glazing, double glazing, and historic buildings. The historic buildings officer in the planning department has no powers as an officer. She makes recommendations. The problem is that the, the, the department tends to go with the recommendations. Now, in the last seven months, the planning panel has overturned the majority of those decisions and have allowed window changes and window replacements, some of them next door to here in, um, in Craig Street. So there is the planning panel don't accept, and the island plan doesn't really work in that regard. Finally, the most frustrating question are three of them. It's come up three times. It's been reform of the states. It's a how, how do, do I get over my frustration that only seven deputies out of 29 supported the last report and proposition, and it failed. Only seven deputies out of 29 su supported the final attempt at reform of the states, and I'm the only one on this panel tonight that supported it. Chris McGee. Mr Shaw, with regards to living wage, um, all expenditures occurred by a business are paid for by the customer. That's, that's basic economics. But that being said, as it stands, Social Security, i.e. your money, spends a 
very big percentage of its budget on effectively subsidizing companies who aren't paying their, their employees enough. I mean, Henry Ford realized that in order to sell more cars, he needed to pay enough such that the people that built them could actually go out and buy them. So I, I don't think there, there is a, there's a one solution to it. I think the best thing to do is every time you spend money, you, that in, in itself is a vote. You, you give money to the, to the businesses that have high standards and high uh, ethical codes of practice, and you shy away from, from the companies that don't. Norway, for example, has no minimum wage. Yet if you work in Burger King, you earn approximately 15 pounds an hour. So it is, it is not necessarily the case that raising the minimum wage would, would be, a, would be a, a solution across the board. Planning regulations are far too burdensome. Uh, and I think that you, know, you, sh you shouldn't have to pan, you know, plead to the government, please can I install some, some double glazing because, because my family are cold for, for six months of the year. I don't think that that's right. Um, and Conrad, you're absolutely right. There are, there are a cross-section of those in the States to whom the rules do not apply. And this isn't restricted just to planning. Um, the hardest question that I was asked at one of the, one of the hustings was about... Dual we'll compliance. never know. I, no, I, think we should, <laughs> I think we should let him answer that, don't you? Yeah, go um, on. The hardest, the hardest question I was asked at uh, hostings, like the agricultural hostings in Trinity, I was asked a question about dual compliance. I didn't know what it meant. Um, but now I do. It's having two. Thank you, Chris. That's brilliant. To, to That's great. <laughs> uh, Ian Gorse. Uh, thank you. Yes, living wage. The uh, living wage. chief minister's department and social security department is doing some work on this. It's quite complex. It looks about base costs across the community, and then you formulate what a living wage is. If you look to what they've done in uh, the UK, it's not something that's compulsory or uh, legislated for, but what some businesses are doing are using it as a differentiation and a competition point. So they're advertising that they pay the living wage, and they're getting uh, more people into the shop. So we're working on it, but it will not be uh, legislated for. The uh, planning uh, regulations, of course, I, I have no problem uh, with historic buildings being listed, but those buildings have got to be lived in. They've got to be used for the way that we live today. And if we just uh, put permits on them to stop that, then we are not protecting the p buildings for the uh, future. Uh, sir, I have... Uh, given the last three years of my life to serve the community that I love as Chief Minister. I hope you'll be disappointed if I've found any question uh, during this election period uh, difficult, because, because I haven't. The difficulty I have had is only having 90 seconds to answer three questions. This government has started to put right things that have been long wrong in our community. There's much more to do, uh, and that's why I said at the start, sir, if you give me my vote, I will dedicate another three years of my life to continuing to put those things right. Thank you. Uh, Jeff Habin. Mr Shaw, uh, living wage, always aspirational, um, something that, especially as an economy recovers and becomes more robust, that we can close the gap between a minimum wage and a living wage. But there all, will always be a gap there. But I would also be most interested in trying to fight, close the gap and the equality of, of, the, of the wages paid to men and women at the same rate. Because at the moment that is there and that is not fair. Planning regulations. Uh, yes, protecting our heritage and listed buildings. The problem we also have is that materials technology is changing far quicker than we can ever change regulations. There should be far more discretion. We need above all in every house to insulate it to keep the energy costs down because that is what is costing every family money and that is what we must save. The most difficult hustings questions is always the ones that you would actually like to spend maybe an hour on your feet trying to answer fully because you, uh, 30 seconds or so that were allocated is just, a, ju just not enough. But if you want to know the one question that absolutely threw me, it was again, it was at the agricultural hustings and it was being asked the views on the cross-compliance regulations between organic and conventional farming. And I have to be honest, I hadn't got a clue. <laughs> Dr. 
David Richardson. Uh, with regard to the first question about, um, about the uh, response uh, time of jobs, etc., I think a good guidance is given by Social Security. That is good enough, and that will help when it comes in. The second question, planning regulation. Well done. This is the first question we've had on planning, and it's everybody's nightmare. Um, first of all, timing should be put on. There should be a time limit on the response time. And secondly, uh, with regards to double glazing, that's everybody's headache. There, I believe there's a woman up there who drives a Porsche around, who works for Heritage, and says no to anything. It must be wooden double glazed. Well, quite frankly, that is absolutely ridiculous. She not only should be fired, she'll be hung, drawn and quartered, because there are many, many different types of windows out there that are absolutely fantastic, perfect, and above all, energy efficient. That you don't seem to think about. They don't seem to think about the practicalities of everything. Right. Finally, the worst question is the worst question I found was the one about the constables. Um, I'm not a no or yes. I'm a yes. In other words, <laughs> I believe they should have their own assembly and we should have ours. And they should be invited in to talk about things that are, in fact, to do with the parish. I can't see why a constable should be interested in that much volume of paper to deal with the JFSC. Now, it makes common sense. I, getting this point across has been really difficult, but I do believe there's a question for a no. So I am sitting on a no, okay? Thank you. <laughs> Zoe Cameron. I found trying to find 30 second answers to these questions virtually impossible and it's made me think about the fact that actually what we what it encourages is simple sound bite solutions to very complex problems and I wonder if that's actually what's wrong with politics um, when it comes to living wage <coughs> it's clearly hasn't kept pace with rent rises utilities and food bills and it's one of the reasons I've stepped out of my surgery and come into politics, as I see people actually struggling to be able to come to the doctor. Um, with the problems with the austerity, austerity politics is that, in fact, it is the poorest people that spend the most in the local community. And I, I wonder how we're going to get an economic recovery when we're just constantly cutting that. Joseph Roundry has just published... a. Um, a report that says the 300 richest individuals in the world now have more wealth than the lowest 3 billion, and that's clearly wrong as far as I'm concerned. But we used to have rent controls and housing controls, perhaps that's what we should think about reintroducing. Um, with regards to planning, I think there's far too much adherence to process, and common sense doesn't appear to be very common. Thank you. Andrew Green. Uh, with regard to the living wage, it is under review and, of course, it is something that we should aspire to. But a very quick cut to that is to actually ensure that the schools produce the young people that we want with the skills that we want, that will meet the industry needs and they'll be paid properly as skilled tradesmen. That would help a great deal. Uh, planning and building regulations, well, frankly, some of it's barking. I, I can understand that we would want to keep an example of a school, for example, uh, a, a sort of 18th century school, we keep one example of that. But I was brought up in a house where the toilet was down the lane and we shared it with seven cottages. Do we need to preserve that? And by the way, we had no electricity. We had free gas mantles. I suppose we better keep the free gas mantles there. We better not go to an electric light. No, it's barking. It needs to be sorted out. And people have a right to live in a home that is modern and uh, energy efficient and as they would like to, to live in. So uh, the question, the most difficult question, Mr. Callanane, uh, was the one about the cross-subsidy. You didn't ask me this, but the easiest question was the one about uh, whether equal marriage should be allowed. For me, it's very simple. The answer to that is yes. It's not compulsory, by the way. <laughs> uh, you know, I think uh, when we get to the day where someone who grovels on the ground hauling out potatoes is recognised doing a worthwhile job. We'll be getting close to a proper living wage. Uh, in the meantime, I think we have to look at uh, minimum wage as the bottom line legal level. Now, planning is a complete minefield. I used to be on the planning committee, and I've said now to at least uh, 
two or three presidents and ministers of planning, when it comes to windows, as long as they leave the hole in the wall, it doesn't really matter what they put in it because the next person will come round and decide, no, that's not fashionable, so I want a different lot. lot. Um, that's the way to do it, common sense approach. Now, I've spent um, 20 years in the television business being a professional poser of questions, so I can't tell you how much I enjoy getting questions. It makes a real change for what I've done for an awful long time. I enjoy giving the answers. Uh, I'm glad I wasn't first on agricultural cross-field compliance, but that's when uh, intensive farmers spray onto organic land, and that really messing things up. Uh, as for the guy with the gigabyte problems, I think I really should, should have told him it's time he upgraded his router. That would have sorted it all out. <laughs> Sarah Ferguson. Yes, um, if you pay your staff a fair wage, you have happy staff and you get better results. Um, you know, there is, we have a minimum wage to provide the minimum, but uh, anyone who wants a successful business knows they can't get away with paying the minimum wage. Um, planning. If the materials, if modern materials are sympathetic, I really have no idea why you can't have plastic windows um, that look like wood, but actually give you better insulation and stop the draft blowing through and, you know, absolutely keep the place warm. I mean, there's people down in the east of the island who were having the trouble with putting plastic windows in their house because it, they rattled and let the draft in, the old ones, I thought was absolutely disgraceful. And which question is most difficult? Yeah, it's this business of trying to think of a sound bite in sort of 30 seconds. Um, you know, particularly when you get a question that really requires a bit more thought and a bit more discussion of the intricacies um, uh, included, you know, it's like planning for the future when in actual fact some of what we think are problems now are actually, you know, uh, will be solved in the future. It's Thank you. Uh, Lyndon Farnham. A very good question, Christian. I believe we should have a living wage. It was introduced in the UK and London in 2005. And I think there's indisputable um, uh, evidence that it's provided economic dividends to the economy, to the employees, and most importantly to the employers themselves. So I would, uh, I would support that, but it, ha it can't be binding, um, of course, for a number of reasons which I don't have time to explain. I don't understand planning sometimes. I really don't. I can't pretend to. And I think what we need to do is introduce uh, the next planning minister, make sure somebody, we put somebody in with a huge amount of common sense, if indeed somebody is going to exist with that in the next state's assembly. Um, <laughs> the hardest question I've had is the question we, ha we, we have about young people. Um, because I feel quite embarrassed about that because I don't really know what to say because we do let our young people down. We're not trying hard enough to engage them in the political process. And, um, you know, full respect to the young man who's gone home, actually, by the way, now. He probably didn't like the way we answered the question for, for, for asking it. We must try harder to get young people to engage in the political process. But my dream is we get, actually, the people you elect, elect to engage more in the political process. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I hesitate to ask this question, but it is the last of the senatorial hustings, and nobody in the room looks particularly tired. I, I, I'm just curious to know, in just one sentence, why we in, in St. Helia should vote for the candidates. And I wonder if m members of the uh, audience would like to hear from each candidate in turn, in one very short sentence, no. of why uh, we in St. Helia should vote for them. They, you can see they're not prepared for this question. No. Um, what, what are members? Would you like to hear that? Yes. yes. Good. Okay. Let's very quickly, let's start with uh, Philip Balash because he's kind of in the middle of the, of the right-hand group over there. Well, why should we vote for each senator? Thank you. Um, well, I think I'm obviously the best candidate. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
and uh, Conrad. Because I'm almost the youngest and I, I will engage young people to vote. <laughs> Alan McLean. Uh, I'm hopefully the second best candidate and I support um, uh, St. Helier paying, uh, receiving rates. Thank you. Uh, Sean Power. Hard work, commitment and my, my work in the third sector and I'm the third best candidate. <laughs> Chris McGee. Well, I think one sentence. Um, I think that people on the island should vote for me because I'm not afraid to speak out I'm not afraid to tell the truth, and uh, there are other people sat in front of you who that find that very difficult at times. Uh, Ian Gorse. Uh, hopefully, hopefully I've answered that in my other question, but I have put before the electorate a manifesto that I believe that if you elect me, I can deliver. It's not wild promises, it's changes for the better for our community, for everyone. Thank you. Jeff Habin. I'm new blood for you, and I have very much a will to get on with it. David. This is going to be a very long sentence. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a scientist, teacher, origin of the DNA fingerprinting, population expert, also trained as an accountant, done more exams than anybody else in this room, are very level-headed, Love the challenges. Lots of ideas. Thank you. Zoe Cameron. So, in the next three years, there's a lot of money going to be spent on your health service, and I think it would be very helpful to have someone who's actually worked throughout the sector with experience on island and off island, to, who's aware of the sort of gaps and weaknesses guiding that process. Thank you. Andrew Green. Because for the last six years, I have worked and dedicated my time as your St. Helier deputy. I have courage and vision, I think independently, and I have a track record of getting things done. And I would like to apply that to my next role in the States if you appoint me as a senator. Thank you. Born in St. Helier, played in the streets in St. Helier, educated in St. Helier, worked in St. Helier, live in St. Helier. I know how St. Helier has been messed around over the years and I'll make sure it will stop happening. Sarah Ferguson. Common sense, practicality, no spin. Lyndon Farnham. Ladies and gentlemen, vote for me if you like my views, vote for me if you share my visions, but more importantly, just get out and vote. Thank you. John Young. I was brought up in, in, in an urban area in London. I came to Jersey 35 years ago. It's given me everything I've got. And I've had the great careers, and I want to give back to the community. What you see is got what you get with me. Open transparency and honesty. No spin, definitely. Malcolm Ferry. I've given three years of my spare time to this parish when I served a period of time as a centenaire for the parish of St Helier. So I understand the problems within the parish, but I also understand the, the problems of the whole island. So I want to tackle those problems from the inside. Thank you. Philip Ozel. Um, Mr Constable, you asked about uh, what uh, we were going to do for St Helier. Uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, I think I'm the only candidate. I don't want to be the best. I just want to be in the top eight, if I may. I'm the only candidate um, that actually has done a special uh, deal for St Helier and a new deal for St Helier. And my final sentence, Mr Constable, is that I've worked tirelessly to secure Jersey's future. Hard work and difficult decisions get the job done. Things are improving. I need your support to continue working for you, and especially those of you who live in St Helier. Thank you very much. And Southern. I live in the parish, I listen to people's problems, I understand them, and I want to get into the States to do something about them. And I clearly lead opinion, because at the beginning of this campaign, I was the only one talking about the living wage, and now everybody wants it. <laughs> uh, Paul Ruggier. 
Well, I hope I've shown that I've uh, got a track record of being uh, caring, compassionate and understanding people's uh, needs. And uh, if I'm able to continue to serve you in the capacity as a senator, I'd be very pleased. Thank you very much. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes the St. Helier Senatorial Hustings. Thanks again to Reverend Tony Morley for letting us have the use of the building. Thank you to our St. Helier Electoral Officer for ringing that bell so lustily. Uh, thank you to the candidates for uh, coping with those questions, particularly the last one they weren't ready for. Uh, thank you to you for coming and showing your interest in this um, hustings. And please do vote on Wednesday and encourage your friends and relations to do so as well. Thank you very much.